welcome to Soul of Travel. Um, I am very excited today to be joined by Elisa Spampanato. And we had the pleasure of connecting in the um, Transformational Travel Council in the space of that. And so I feel like every conversation that has come out of that connection and community has been really treasured. So I'm excited today for everyone to join us and to hear about you. Um, for those of you joining, um, Elisa is a writer and trains others um, in storytelling focused on community-based tourism. And these are stories that really connect us at a grassroots level and are stories that are meant to both educate and create connections. So I'm so happy to bring this subject and this conversation to Soul of Travel. So welcome. Thank you, Christine. I'm, I'm pleased to be yeah, being invited to this uh, to your postcard, to podcast. And uh, I know since we we met, I met a great friend through the TTC, and then uh, your our connection is uh, like back uh, during the, the first lockdown. So I treasure this connection that well. So distant in a moment so intense. So I thank you. I'm very happy to be here and to share part of my work, my experience, and with the hope to inspire um, and create some thought, some reflection on the, on the subject. So very happy yeah. to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and I definitely invite people, and I know we'll, we'll probably address this, but much of this process, like you said, is, is about creating um, awareness, like setting up questions that we need to ask ourselves and ask of others. And so this is a very, I think, should be a very thought provoking um, conversation and um, one that is really okay to not walk away with answers, but to walk away with questions. So we'll just set Absolutely. that stage. <laughs> Absolutely. So this is a time to, to ask you know, ourselves a question, probably new kind of question to get new answers. So this is the right time for humanity, I would say, and the tourism industry in particular. So yeah. yeah. Uh, well, as we begin our conversation, I would love to hear from you, kind of what was your journey that brought you into travel or how, how did travel find you? And then, um, and then a little bit about your work and then we'll explore that more as we work through our conversation. Brilliant, perfect, thank you. So I haven't started in tourism actually. Uh, my background is, um, is in, in anthropology and social science. I'm a sociologist and anthropologist. And um, I've been, I got involved with um, international cooperation with uh, social projects at the grassroots level. I went to Brazil to finish my first master and then I do another master in Brazil and I stay there for a few months. And where that uh, then when is, uh, I met tourism or tourism found me in a way because I, I discovered um, uh, communities in a very uh, special environment in a way, because usually we think about traditional community in rural area. The first time I met community involved with tourism were in urban urban environment in the, in the city of Rio de Janeiro. So, and I, I decided to do my, my research, my dissertation on slum tourism because I found it so fascinating because there there was all the aspect that was working on the local development, the cultural issue, uh, the tourism came by with very different, different ways. So sometimes it was very um, exploitative and destructive and uh, other times in other cases was actually something coming up from the grassroots. And I heard at the time, ah, oh, slum tourism is bad. So, I usually try to avoid the one direction answer or fit for, fit for all. And I thought, oh, here there is more, let me dig in. And I started to you know, explore different favelas in Rio de Janeiro and uh, I studied, I did a case study of six. And uh, this dissertation became a book years later. Um, so that is the way I, I found oh, tourism or tourism found me because I found there was a space where I could, uh, um, all my interests and my passion were, coming together. So the anthropology studies, the, the culture, the, the, the economic development and the self-empowering of the community and community-based tourism. So I found very interesting and so and since then I, I started working with it in Brazil with different kind of community and then I went back to London and uh, apart from uh, a big parenthesis where I was uh, teaching Tai Chi actually for a while, I was an instructor of Tai Chi and uh, Qigong. Then I go back 
to to tourism and community based tourism it, from a different perspective but so i my journey with tourism was also different because i started from university i start engaging uh, in uh, in projects social projects initially just with a local ngo or international corporation on the side and then it went to when i moved to london especially i was volunteering with tourism concern so more uh, campaigning awareness for um, pro or ethical tourism and responsible tourism i'm talking about 2011 and then I had that uh, gap, but then I go back in 2016, I got involved with um, G GSTC, became a member, did a, a lot of things, but from a different perspective and, until I decided to go into the trade because uh, I was, I ended up, I was ending up talking also always with people that I ag agree with me in terms, yeah, there is a, Tourism can be exploited, but also can be um, supported, can va give value and, uh, and space and help in the women empowerment and all the local development, and cultural conservation, environmental protection, but when, how? But because the big change uh, weren't happening, it was start becoming frustrated. So I say, okay, that, now we have to move in another space. So that's why I ended up working in communication and marketing. And me as an anthropologist, I never thought I'm gonna end up working in marketing somehow. I'm not a marketer, but mm. I, I work uh, with the local community. So I support them to tell their own story mm -hmm. and define the space on an international uh, and global level uh, where usually space there aren't for different reasons so yeah that's why that's what i do uh, apart from telling the story because uh, when i first moved to london and i realized that in places where we were talking about ethical tourism and responsible tourism these stories that these projects that i i met in brazil were in there so i say there's something there is a big gap here and mm -hmm. is a language barrier, is a cultural barrier, is the lack of marketing, a lack of uh, contact to say, okay. So the story kind of asked me to be told. So I started telling the stories first in some blogs, Tourism Concern, um, also Quality in Tourism, which I'm um, uh, an associate and I carry on. Mm -hmm. And I decided uh, in the lockdown, okay, I have to do this, mm, like uh, this should become the main part. Or what I do, the and then uh, yeah, that's why. And then things, is, my journey still continue. But what I do is this: I tell the story of local community with them, so with an ethnographical approach, rather from here. Yeah, about them. Yeah, I love that. And um, I mean, I think your story actually is really representative of a lot of people that I speak with that kind of really find themselves. Um, or tourism finds them because they're out there engaging with the world. And, and it's just, um, for me, what I say a lot of times is that travel is less about going someplace and more about unwrapping and staring, sharing the story of the world with others. And like, that's, that's how I perceive travel is this way for me to show this beauty and this story and people with others. And so I think, and I also have a background in sociology. And I, so I really understand that perspective. I think it immediately drops us into this, um, this space of being people focused and being culture focused and starting to ask those same questions that you found yourself asking. And then you know, you said it's interesting, you find yourself working in marketing, but really as, as someone with your, um, with your academic background, who is really able to tell those stories, and we start seeing marketing shifting towards this storytelling model, like it 100% makes sense now, I'm sure like, as you follow the breadcrumbs, it doesn't make sense. But then when you look at it from a, a wider lens, um, and what I would love to do here to um, begin this conversation is really start to understand some of these things that started coming your way. You mentioned you were working in responsible tourism and you found yourself kind of like seeing these disconnects between place and people, but I would like to help people understand more um, 
for instance, what does community-based travel mean to you and why is that focus so important? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, it's a very valid question because um, it can mean different things in different places. So is uh, um, they so this is because uh, what we talk, for example, in Brazil, community-based tourism has a very strong con political connotation because it's used as a used literally a, a, as an instrument as a tool to affirm the identity of local minorities or um, cultural minorities to uh, affirm their identity. And then so they use this term to talk about something that I will tell you in a second because I, I kind of absorb it from Brazil, from Latin America, while in Asia, this term might mean something slightly different. Now, even though if you call it community tourism, community-based tourism, community-led tourism, what we all agree, and right now we have uh, also the um, big um, tour operators, the leader, world leaders, um, tour operators of uh, solo independent travel, like um, G Adventures and Intrepid, they're using this term. So something that uh, is becoming more, we've become more familiar with. So when we talk about community tourism, okay, community-based tourism, in the case I use it, is when there is, to, let's say two pillars. One is fundamental. The second can be or not be there. The first is that the community has to be the protagonist. So meaning the community is in charge of the core design or design for design of the experience is the one that get the profit, is the one that manages, is the one that uh, is in charge of uh, development. So is uh, it's not just uh, the community is not receiving passively tourists because some others brought them there and that they be given some pennies let's say, as a, as a thanks. No, it's the other way around. It's a grassroots bottom-up kind of a, um, experience. Of course, we can't say it's 100% designed by that because sometimes it's just a co-design. Depends on the case. But the most important thing is the profit goes there to the community mainly. And then the, the tour operator, they help to build that connection, they take part is the other way around, right? That a model they used to run. So the other pillar, which I think is really important and not always, unfortunately, is possible to have is uh, that tourism is uh, just a complementary activity. It's not the main activity. Be this is because these create that independence. So tourism, as I said, as I used earlier, the word used by community, yes. Community, when they are strong, they are, um, uh, they strong in themselves as identity. They know who they are. They want what they know what they want. Um, they are aware that tourism is a risk, put at risk their own uh, culture, their own roots. If become the main activity, if the tourism, so the money, the profit from tourism become the only goal, is is gonna because we see in the past that many communities are aware of this they risk uh, they will risk to lose their ident identity so they don't want to do that and no one should aim to build a project where it will uh, destroy or leave on the side of the traditionalist um, activities now saying that sometimes in some cases tourism became the main activity because was the way that the community used to survive or depend in some case of indigenous community um, because they have no land to, so they had to really, they had to, to add uh, the income from tourism to help support their own uh, existence. But at all the community, they are aware of themselves that they know of their history and they know what tourism can be. They don't want tourism to be the only activity because it's, it's, it's a contradiction. We want to visit the community because the community has a history, has a, has a lifestyle. Traditional activity can might change during the year because of climate change, because of different uh, distribution of land, etc. But at the end of the day, tourism comes after as uh, to support so and uh, share what they are which means all the traditional activity they are involved with, and they don't want to really uh, uh, lose. And sometimes there is actually help them to rediscover those activity and you know, help in the cultural conservation. There are many examples of this, but 
Uh, I don't know if I answer your question. Yes, yes. No, thank you so much. I mean, I think it's really important to understand that at the base of community tourism is this um, either this collaboration or community driven focus of what is actually happening there. And so, you know, as you mentioned, in a lot of places, this outside force is coming in and describing and controlling what tourism looks like. And then also through that, um, really leading where the money goes. And mo tr in the traditional tourism model in these communities, most of the tourism dollar doesn't stay in that community. So like you said, this focuses on really ensuring that these communities receive the economic benefit first. Um, and then the other thing that you said there that I think is so important, especially as we've seen through the this COVID pandemic, is that we don't create a model where communities are so dependent on tourism that the loss of tourism is detrimental. And I mean, we've seen that happen greatly over the course of the last two years. And so I think it's really, really important to examine how those structures have been into, put into place and asking the questions of, how, how do we create a more self-sustaining model? What are, what are we asking of these communities? What can they create and then build upon that we can enjoy with, but not for the sole intention of tourism? And so it's been really interesting because I, I have seen through the communities, some of the communities that I work with where tourism has you know, not been inaccessible over the whole course of this time, tourists might not still be returning for I don't know, you know, an untold amount of time still to some of these rural communities and things like they are creating um, regenerative agricultural practices that um, are very fundamental to these communities. But in the future, this might be a really interesting way to create a cultural connection where we can go in and see these projects that they've created understand more like farm to table cuisine or how this kind of small um, you know suburban farming was created like that as a tourism experience is something that's much more representative of the destination and is community led and has a greater purpose for the community than say a um, traditional performance or something like that that has like you said is much more extractive and isn't really um, kind of loses its actual true connection to the destination. So um, thank you for sharing that because I think that that is very helpful to understand. Um, the other thing that I would love to look at is why storytelling is so important. Um, and I know when we've talked in the past, you've mentioned because it is so immediate, it's such an easy way to create a connection. As humans, we understand stories, like we are storytellers, right? This is how history has been shared over the course of, of, of our time. Um, and things like poems and songs are ways that we, we remember the stories and share the stories. Um, so why is it important to tell these stories and what what does this create? What does this allow for? Yeah, thanks for the question. Yes, we are all storytellers. We, our brain is uh, is uh, is made to absorb storytelling. It's the story is the way we learn about the world. We 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 connect. We understand the world, and we live so since ever. So this tells you a lot about the instrument, powerful instrument is. But when we talk about communities, even more important because uh, it comes uh, this aspect that these stories, most of these stories, are not uh, visible, and doesn't mean that they're not going to exist. But if they're not told, of course, from the eyes to the eyes of the tourists, are in existence, right? And these are the stories that are more value. They represent more value to those stories that really want to have uh, an authentic experience. And I use this word with, uh, with, the, with, um, with the times because I know that it's been overused, but when we talk about a, a, a cultural experience, to me, being and spending time in the community, urban or rural, um, modern or, or, or traditional, is the most direct way to experience that community, being, uh, sorry, that culture, being with the 
people from the community, spending time with them. This doesn't mean that everyone wants to do that kind of experience, but if you look for the 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 culture in that place where you're going to visit and you're going to travel to you really need to spend time with people that live there and the community based tourism allow you to get deep to have a deep uh, in depth in um, deep yeah, experience because it's not filtered mm-hmm. and the storytelling from them becomes very important because what happened, even though for the experience that already exists, if you don't tell the story, this becomes isolated. So they, 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 the, community, the experience is available, but the tourists can get there. The story can, storytelling in particular, can help to create this bridge. And this bridge is um, not only knowledge, but is also preparation in which sense and and the TTC in a way I, I like this a lot is like we you know when we go and visit other places we might suffer a cultural shock right because we we want to visit places that are exotic out of uh, you know out of our normal experiences right so this means that sometimes my, we might be put in a place that okay I don't know this uh, what this means and uh, this is good because it's, you learn but at the same time because we're talking of coming into a community and then coming in relation with people is important to have a support i think to create this bridge and prepare yourself mm-hmm. because just to give an example so i was talking during the lockdown because i met a lot of community members through zoom during the lockdown i couldn't go anywhere and i couldn't go anywhere we chat a lot so I met this amazing woman. She's a, a Mapuche that um, she moved to Santiago, so in the city. So this is a long story, but Mapuche, the majority lived in the city. Unfortunately, we moved from the rural, but the, she had a strong connection with as all the Mapuche with the land. But then she told me, just to come back to the point of a cultural clash or misunderstanding, uh, I asked her at the end of our interview, I say, tell me, you know, do you remember any weird question or something that a tourist might have asked you that make you laugh or puzzled you or something? Say, oh yeah, once uh, <laughs> one lady asked me, what do you sleep? So like a I sleep in a bed, you know, maybe people have this idea on was sleeping on a, on a bunch of leaves. So I don't know. I mean, we human, we live, we are in 2021 in the city of Santiago. What do you think I sleep? This is like some like a funny, but if you think, well, if someone asks this kind of question means that we have in our mind an idea mm-hmm. of this traditional community, especially when we talk about indigenous, which is out of the world, like totally disconnected. And this comes back to what you were saying before, Culture changes. Yeah, we and so we have to admit and be prepared that with oh, this uh, folklorization of culture, these uh, performances sometimes are being created because tourists want to see that. But actually, that was something that is not real anymore. Maya being one day, so tourists should be more prepared to expect that the culture change over time. They might still nice like to wear their dress, their traditional dresses, but maybe not every day. Why not? Maybe they want to go to university, they open their own businesses. And this happened in, in a lot of cases, even with the Cayenne women in, um, in, uh, in Thailand, they, they want to be entrepreneurs. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. We have to be aware that, you know, so telling these stories also tells you a story of a first, because in the first place, it's so hard to tell the story of a community. And I, I'm the first to say, I'm not about in the in dual, individualization. So I need to, okay. The, indiv- the individuals, the person before the community, for me is the opposite. But when you have to tell a story, the community is so diverse, has a lot of power dynamics within it, a lot of history and the layers that you cannot tell the story of the community. What is the story of that community? It's much easier to help the tourists to connect with another individual, and that's what I do. So one-to-one, human-to-human, and through the story of another human being, you can maybe start to understand what her or his community is, so his dimension, the context. Mm -hmm. So that's why I will invite everyone to read the story of Graciela um, that I shared uh, last year, um, just to have an idea 
you see this woman, you might visit her, but you don't know what is behind, what is background, you know, that memory about a grandparent, why she moved to Santiago. She might have no time to tell you all this in one, one visit, for example. So she's very happy to share the story, but sometimes there is no time. So a story can help to bridge that gap and to connect uh, human to human. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's very powerful because, sorry, I think it's powerful because I allow this connection. Um, yeah, direct and yeah. unfiltered. Yeah, um, it just, you reminded me of, I remember when I was really little, um, I grew up in Montana in the United States, which is very rural. It's also really depicted as kind of rugged Western cowboy. Um, even when I was young, I remember someone um, saying, oh, do you, do you ride a horse to school? And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, no, I don't ride a horse to school. Like, where, where is that image being painted or where, what, where is that context coming from? And I just remember, I think this was the beginning maybe of my like sociological <laughs> inclination. It was like, how, how is this being represented, uh, represented and where did they pick up this filter or, you know, way of seeing a particular place? And, you know, this is um, kind of the next thing that I wanted to talk about is how storytelling really helps to break down stereotypes. Um, looking at who is telling the story is really important. Um, stepping away from these kind of dominant narratives of travel, which for example, might be this thing that I just shared about, you know, living in Montana and riding a horse to school or the story you shared where, you know, you're indigenous, you must be sleeping like not in a house, in a bed. Um, like where do, where do those stories come from? And then also looking at the way that the, the story of travel is told now, which, or historically has been very sanitized, has been very, um, has a, reinforces power, um, power hierarchies, creates, um, the conditions for these extractive relationships that we were talking about, like very one-sided um, conversations or performances, or even if you're storytelling, it's not a two-way exchange. And so um, I, I would just love to talk a little bit about that. Like how does your work in educating both storytellers and local communities to tell their story, how does that kind of break down some of this um, dominant narrative? Right, thanks. Thanks for the question, because I think it's, uh, it's really crucial, especially in the moment we are. So um, I think uh, the image that we have of places is becoming what it is, not because the industry is a bad, right? Because it's simpler, it's simpler doing this. Because uh, as a human, when we have, we do that, we have all stereotypes about German, Italian, Spanish. In our head, there is something um, that he can, you know, summarize what that culture is. And of course, when you visit the place, you will realize if you visit once, you know, if you open mind, you will understand that they, 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 that this one case and, you know, the, the picture is bigger. Now, when we talk about marketing, when we talk about how do we present a place, a destination, now, I realize that uh, this top-down uh, kind of um, way of presenting it is also a result of lack of time, is also a result of lack of uh, skills, because um, when, so what I propose is to um, kind of uh, rethink the travel marketing in a way that is really from bottom up. So the grassroots should be the ones talking about themselves, presenting the destination, because first of all, destination is not just a place. Destination is made of beautiful nature, of course, and you know, all the natural environment, biodiversity, but also people, meaning culture, meaning tradition, meaning lifestyle. So why don't we involve them in the presentation of a destination? Why also this will give an extreme advantage I'm talking about um, competitive sort of advantage to to destination itself when you had to present yourself, you know, uh, at uh, 
to the tourists because when we talk South, about South America, we have a lot of images that are kind of similar. I wouldn't say mm -hmm. you can put together two images and oh, this is a beautiful sunset and um, it can be Chile, but also it can be Argentina or it can be in Peru. Mm -hmm. um, but so what it makes the place really unique is the culture, uh, the people. So what I'm trying to do with my work is actually adding to the one direction and partial narrative other narratives which are from the bottom up um so is is and I was, as i was saying before is a work that takes time of course is longer but in fact the work that i do with the community is uh, creating co-creating because as we're now talking about co-designing experiences finally after decades of uh, presenting a product to the community and you know using the community you know, in, in another, you know, top down, we start talking about co-designing experiences finally, but then now we start, we should start talking about co-designing the marketing. Mm -hmm. And this is, it comes after, you know, it's just a natural, because if you present an experience or, or if you co-design an experience, but this experience is not is, uh, presented in the way it is, and you try to use other model of other experiences to talk about that experiences, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So this is a quite innovative concept. I understand and every time I, I talk with people, some people uh, agree, yes, for, of course, but who's going to do that? Because usually it's easier to send someone in a place and do a brief um, you know, description of what it is than actually having someone there for a while that can actually create and co-create the way the experience will it is and would be presented because and this when I work with community because this work I do with community because I am a storyteller but I don't want to be the only community storyteller so in my ideal world I won't be necessary that would be of course I will write my story but of my experiences but also the majority would be uh, community members telling their own story presenting their own uh, community-based tourism project to tourists and when I talk to them in the first place, I say, okay, you are a storyteller already. You don't need anyone else to come here and tell your story. Mm -hmm. You are. Now, also how you can tell the story is up to you. You don't need to have a master in journalism to tell a story. And you can tell it because it talks about experience. It tells about experience. The most direct and the most, uh, the less filtered, better. So it can be a song, a picture, um, a, a video. So the way you present the experience, uh, you know, as a marketing tool, so using the storytelling and marketing tool can be, can have different forms. So, and that opens up and you see the, the, the sparkles in there, say, okay, yeah, great. So opens up possibility because you, you, I don't do much in the workshop in a way. I just give them, I open the door, say, look, your creativity is the way. You have the story, I can help you guide you in this process. And I, you know, but at the end of the day, if you show them that there is a, everyone, we are clearly being, we are in general as a human, that's what make a different from the animals, right? We create things that haven't exist, that don't exist before. And once you assume and you recognize the power that you have, the sky is the limit and beyond. So it's, it's, it's incredible to see how empowering is the, 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 the storytelling for them. Because uh, in this case, until now, the main experience I had is like uh, when I'm talking to them and asking about their story and creating a story with them based on their experience. But simple things, the moment I, I publish the story and they see the story published and I ask my ex relatives to translate it for them because usually English is not a main the first language, even not the second, but uh, they, they kind of uh, say, oh, this might be, oh, it's being published. It might be, you know, interesting something. So it's, it's great. So you see that they actually are um, empowered by the experience. Mm -hmm because they say, oh, my story is important. And tourism has been showing, you know, in, in the practical, you know, I have a lot of examples that um, being involved in a tourism experience uh, give the opportunity to the community to 
to understand the value that their culture represents. Because everyone, I, I was born close to Rome, and for me, um, all the history I have around me was kind of taken for granted. That is always happened. Now, when you see, you know, tourists coming from miles away and visit your village and say, oh, oh, Tivoli, ah, they talk about it. Oh yeah, it's painted from Turner. I'll see it in the National Gallery in London. Must be. So of course, for the community, they usually have their own um, um, reference, which doesn't need to be international, not always it is. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding, kind of uh, stepping out of that community and see how important is they their culture. This is something. This is something that happened very often when they start involving themselves with tourism. So yeah. this is important. So this is an important part of this. But it's another aspect, and um, about the the storytelling and empowering is because even before writing and publishing the story, when they tell their own story to me, when I ask them, remember when you were a, a child which uh, kind of activity you were doing? What, what do you like to do? Like uh, you ask this to someone, um, someone that has kind of not forgot, but has lived all her life in another environment, coming back to that moment, you can see even through, the, through a screen that you brought her back. So the story to see a retelling their own story helped her to get it, Kind of in a way, I use this 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 term. I say that I give the story back to them while they're telling me mm -hmm. their story. So mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. They kind of say, "Oh, this is my story. This is me. Oh, what I've done. Look at what I've done in my lifetime." You know. Right. So yeah, that's powerful for me as well. Yeah. Witness in that. Yeah, yeah. To hear the, to find there's a strength in finding your own voice, hearing your story, having it witnessed, and that gives it some next level of importance internally and externally. Um, I know through the work that I do on my sojourns, like a huge part of it is focusing on bringing women to meet with women in wherever we're traveling, often artisans, because I really love how that connection both allows for like a, this human to human understanding and woman to woman understanding, but also when you bring in the artisan part of it, then you're looking at culture and language and storytelling because so many times the, the process of creating the art is the storytelling. Like that's the passing of a story from generation to generation, either literally or figuratively through the symbolism that's maybe woven or carved. Um, and so I, I love that idea of thinking about bringing more power to that process. And, you know, I, I have, I remember sitting down with a group of weavers in Guatemala and they were trying to teach me how to do embroidery and they had assumed we were going to be able to accomplish this huge project because it's really easy for them, right? They're like, oh yeah, we'll do this and this and this in two hours. And like two hours in, I think we've embroidered like this much. And they were kind of laughing and then also like, what are we going to do here? Because we're clearly never finishing this. And I think that experience allowed them also to see to take away um, the idea that it's easy, right? They they maybe think it's easy because it's something mm -hmm. they're doing every day um, and mm -hmm. it's been passed down. But when they see me attempting to do it, they realize that this isn't necessarily easy, right? Um, and so that Absolutely. process is also very empowering and, and sharing. Um, I, I wanted to also speak about, um, Oh, you mentioned, um, well, I just wanted to go back to this, um, kind of from the marketing perspective or the storytelling perspective, using words like um, authentic or local are kind of like these quick ways of tapping a consumer into an experience that we've kind of, we fall back on, right? Because it's easy. We think this automatically paints a picture. Um, and, but really it's such, um, there's so much room for interpretation, right? What does authentic mean? What does local mean? And it's almost, um, again, like it's asking us to be storytellers instead of saying local, what do we mean? 
who is local? What does local mean? Authentic, what do, what do we mean by authentic? Like, what am I actually saying to you? Like, if I'm saying that we're going to, um, I mean, participate in an authentic craft, could I instead say, we're going to sit down with weavers who have lived on this land for four generations who are gonna teach us to dye this, this cloth with local, you know, dyes and um, share meal that's locally produced, you know, that's what authentic means, but we're just like trying to one-off market it. So we just say that word, but in, in reality, painting that picture, the storytelling is gonna drop our, our traveler into this experience. And one, they're gonna know if it's for them because their depiction of authentic, they might be like, yes, that's what I want, but really, nope, they don't want that. Or yes, they really want that. And now they know mm -hmm. what they're getting. And so I think, you know, not assuming that those kinds of words are bad or overused and shouldn't be used, but like, why are we using them in the first place? And what do we really mean? Um, I just think that's uh, an interesting way, again, to like, just start asking questions, you know, not putting a label on something being, um, you know, overused or cliche or whatever, but why, why are we using it? What story are we trying to tell? What message are we trying to communicate? And can we just do that instead? Like, don't take the shortcut. Let's go ahead and get like mm -hmm. really, you know, use all of our words and our language and um, our connection tools and really invite people into the literal story of a place. Totally, I, I couldn't be more, uh, I couldn't agree more what you just said with all. Now, I want to just to clarify that I usually, I usually, no, I use the word authentic with a very political, strong political connotation. So for me, authentic is only when the community is kind of authorizing that or the community is involved, but because that meaning, it comes from a grassroots. Of course, if you start using the uh, authentic is becoming uh, sort of you know, maybe already the risk, oh, everyone using it, and what that means. And I totally agree as a storyteller, you just don't use the word, you describe it, what that means in that case. But that description should be the reflection of what the community is happy to share and what the community identify itself with. Mm -hmm. And that, because authentic is something that has to come from the grassroots. And in that, I use it in a political sense and to make an, you know, a statement. Mm -hmm. I kind of use authentic from my imagination. So the authentic is only what is coming from there, is already existing before me going there. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't exist because I'm going there. It exists regardless me. Mm -hmm. And that I think is my, you know, pre, pre uh, you know, my, best definition authentic in this case but I, I agree I wouldn't use it because especially in the marketing I wouldn't use it I use it usually in, a, in, a, in an article where I'm actually talking about the issue and the you know philosophically but mm -hmm. when I'm presenting uh, uh, an experience authentic shouldn't be there because it doesn't say anything oh it's beautiful it's something I do in my worship like, okay what do you talk, how do you present your place? I beautiful, don't use that. What is beautiful for me? It might not be, be beautiful for someone else. The beauty is something very relative and culturally related and socially related. I mean, mm -hmm. it's relative, I mean, to culture and social, uh, sometimes even family. So um, uh, so it's, it's, it's very relative and it can be everything and nothing. So, and yes, I agree with you. Let's paint what actually that is in, in real terms, because we'll attract the right people. So that will be a kind of a way of engaging already. So that's why this is a bridge, you know, you, you're building already because you're describing what actually is gonna be. You might not attract everyone, you know, I'm okay. With that, I attract people that are happy to know that more about it and experience it first time. So yeah, totally. Um, yeah, totally agree. Um, well, I, I'm just looking, I'm like 
this always happens. People are listening or like, oh, here's the time where Christine says, oh, we're almost out of time. And how did it happen so quickly? But we're out of <laughs> time again. Um, but oh, I, we have kind of dived in a little bit to your workshops. You kind of mentioned how you um, cultivate those stories with people. But I just wanted to give you a moment to talk a little bit more specifically that you do offer um, community storytelling workshops. Um, can you just share who that's for and what service that provides um, so that people know uh, a little bit more specifically about the work you do? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, well, the Community Storytelling Workshop is um, directed to community-based tourism project, supported by also um, supported by a tourist board, local government or regional government or DMC, um, DMO, um, so everyone who wants to support those kind of projects, because the students of the workshop are the community members, people involved in tourism, so either um, a tour guide, a local entrepreneur, someone that has an, you know, an idea or product they want to, you know, involve in the, an existing project or creating a new one. And the idea is like, uh, this workshop aim to give the tools these protagonists to telling their own story themselves using it as a using the story as a as a marketing tool so this meaning that uh, in different in some cases this is a workshop that i do with a with a region uh, sometimes in one community or sometimes in with different community um thinking about a co-design workshop yeah to present a new idea or ideas of uh, marketing so this is actually the grassroots um, bottom-up uh, travel marketing that I'm kind of uh, uh, presenting as an idea, which is totally innovative, totally revolutionary because uh, it's take a lot of time, but actually it will give something <laughs> more um, different. I, I wouldn't say eliminate the other one, but this is a, a, a kind of an addition um, to that. So from top down to bottom up, we meet and we have a, a bigger picture of what actually is a destination. So this is the idea. Um, that's why it helps uh, also a community to understand what marketing is. It's not just selling, it's like communicating. Is because for some community marketing is a bad word. I'm right. telling you. So is is uh, and then so marketing is for them as to be seen as an instrument to allow building, you know, this connection, building this, this bridge, like welcoming the right tourists. So that's why it's important that you tell your own story because you will attract the tourists that you want to attract. It's up to you. The community might decide, I want this kind of tourist and not this one. And I present what I, we do in a certain way. So the engagement is okay. The, the, build, the bridge will be uh, right for the right people. Um, so this is a bit, um, yeah, this is a bit of what I do with a workshop. And um, thanks for, for the question, because I think is something, it's very powerful when I see in practice one thing, um, and this, you know, is an ongoing process and people, once they learn doing it, will start experimenting, is multimedia, is, uh, is uh, they see that really the sky is the limit and I will collaborate more on a local level as well among them as entrepreneur and with external uh, supportive, sorry, operators. Yeah. Um, I really, I love that. And I feel like for me, um, I really want to play around with this idea as well, bringing it into my business because I feel like um, I often have a hard time communicating the story I want to tell because I'm trying to use this traditional model and it's not allowing for, I can't fit my like peg into that hole. It just doesn't work. And so something gets lost in the translation because I'm trying to do kind of both things and they're not, I'm not doing either one quite the right way. <laughs> and so I love this, like really thinking about how can I invite the women that I'm connecting with to be the people that talk about this journey and and what it means to them and 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 telling their story and so I'm I'm really excited for the doors that this opens um, both in terms with connecting with travelers but in allowing communities to really take the reins and like you said let letting them dictate who comes and um, setting this precedent that when we travel 
it is not out of a sense of entitlement or our ownership of this experience. It is as a welcomed guest to each community um, that needs to be done respectfully and carefully and thoughtfully and mindfully. And um, I think when we start to approach travel with that intention is when we're really going to see um, travel become much more healing and much less extractive. So um, I really completely, completely. appreciate so much this conversation. I wish that we had more time, but in the future, perhaps we can pick one of these ideas and go a little deeper. Um, but I'm also happy to perhaps be leaving people with questions that they can ask and definitely to reach out to you um, if this has you know, sparked some curiosity, if they wanna have a better understanding of this way of connecting. Um, before we go, one, I want you to let people know how they can reach out to you. And then two, I have just a series of rapid fire questions that we're gonna end our conversation with. So um, Elisa, if you can let people know where they can find you. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, you can find me on Traveler Storyteller is my blog. So my the hub that uh, in the future will ca carry on transforming. But uh, I want to share and I won't share anything more. But at the moment, you can find a lot of these stories and uh, more to come. So travelerstoryteller.com and uh, all social media, um, just the Traveler Storyteller, you will, you will find me there. Um, and uh, yes, I think, um, yeah, I will, you will see, I will, you know, people, if you, you find me on, a, you know, on Facebook and LinkedIn also with that name, so, and with my name, of course, but. Great. Um, okay, so for our rapid fires, um, what is your favorite book or movie that offers you a travel escape or inspires adventure? Oh, wow. Um, I think. It might be my my first 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 book is Momo. Um, I don't know if uh, you heard about it, but this is a story of this little girl that travel on her own, and uh, she's a she's a stranger in a way from the place. But uh, she start being the healing healer and the connector of all the people in the place, and I really like that idea that. Um, by listening and by even a stranger person can help uh, connect and create harmony um, because sometimes we need more time, only time and silent to understand each other. And this is something that tourism can help us with, I think. Um, thank you. That sounds like a, such an interesting um, story and like a, a, a really fun way to kind of look at, look at that. Um, what is always in your suitcase or backpack when you travel? Ooh, a bottle of water, but bottle of, uh, no bottle, um, the one you refill. Yes. The, the <laughs> refilling bottle of yes. water. Um, um, what has been your favorite destination? Oh, uh, um, mm, tricky. I mm. think it's Brazil. Is Brazil and in Brazil, um, Salvador. I felt so connected to Africa in El Salvador, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, visiting the Quilombolas community, I really felt really welcomed and really at home. Mm -hmm. For some reason, maybe uh, I, you know, my you know past life I was somewhere else, but yeah, uh, the Quilombolas community, uh, for you know, founded by uh, former slave, uh, slaves enslaved people and that are this uh, until a few decades ago the Genevan roads they were just built in the in the middle of forest just to escape um, you know the former owners of the plantation so they really lived in in uh, in, 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 a, in a deep relationship with the, with the nature and environment which was very hostile at the beginning but they kind of find their own balance within that and now they, the cohabitance is, uh, is great, it's amazing. And they have a lot of story uh, of this uh, balance and the new, um, rediscovering new balances in the future. But yeah, I think that was a great uh, connection that I made when I went there. Um, I love when we feel so at home somewhere where we think we shouldn't feel at home. And I feel like that's such a good example of like just feeling 
fully human and fully connected in a place. Um, it's just, it always catches me off guard too when you arrive and you expect to feel really uh, disjointed or uncomfortable and you, you just feel, you feel good and you feel like on your two feet and you're like, oh, I wouldn't have expected that. I think that is really the magic of travel. Um, where do you still long to travel to? Uh, everywhere has a someone say and everywhere is on my list yeah <laughs> so yeah I don't know what I'm going to be next but I want to explore um Africa at the moment I've just been um, in Morocco mm -hmm. but I want to explore uh the the heart of Africa and, and then yeah yeah I'm really looking forward to to be there um what is something you eat that immediately connects you to a place you've been Eat. Um, um, I'm not sure. Well, I think um, more than well to my roots because you know I'm I don't know about my roots, but I, I'm Sicilian. Even though I keep traveling, I was born traveling between Rome and Sicily, which have two different words. And you know, the fika d'India is, is a kind of fruit full of seeds, colored, and uh, is a cactus, basically. And that, for me, was my root, uh, even if I found it in somewhere in London, that one tastes the same. But for me, it's like, uh, oh, yeah, that, that is me, that is part of me, um, mm. somehow. And is uh, and when I think about Sicily, I think about root, but I also think about the, the, the the, the love for travel that I, 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 I appreciate by going back and forward um, to Sicily and um, you learn about life. For me, if travel is life, it's not travel, it's not an excursion. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it came to me this, and I want to share that. My guest suggests me this, this fruit. Um, yeah, and I think that, that's what I've shared. Um, who was the person that inspired or encouraged you to set out and explore the world? Yeah, um, well, I think uh, it was a person, you mean, yeah? Um, I don't know. Um, um, an anthropologist. Um, well, I think they were there because when I was when I was studying, I wanted to be an ethnographer. I wanted to be a, an uh, an ethnographer in particular. Now, actually, in the way I am being, um, I, I forgot a name. Uh, Mar uh, Margaret Mead, I think, was her. I yeah. think was her was her because the way she she was able to be in the place and uh, and be so respectful and understanding. Try to. Um, she, she transmitted this idea of respect, of uh, interaction, but in a way that is not um, um, oppressive and uh, not presumption. And uh, I think it was, yeah, probably she, she was one of those and all the other anthropologists that I learned when, uh, when I was growing up, uh, yeah. I yeah. love that you had that um, awareness. I remember just really feeling that too. And until really recently, there hasn't been language around that, right? Like around how do we travel without it being oppressive or extractive? Like it was just a feeling, but there wasn't a language really that went with it. And I love that we both get to be in this industry in a time where now we're talking about that from a place of intention. And um, so I'm so happy to have that kindred connection with you. Amazing, yeah, great. <laughs> um, the, the last question is, if you could take an adventure with one person, fictional or real, alive or past, who would it be? My Angelo. Hmm. I will go with her. Yeah. Um, I will brought her to life, back to life, and go on a train with her through America and North and South America. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. That would be incredible. Um, well, thank you so much for your time today and sharing something that I know is so deeply important to you. And I hope that it just inspired somebody else to think about um, how they're engaging with travel and how they can ask more questions and make it such a meaningful process for themselves and for others. Amazing. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to share 
bit of my journey with you and all the audience. Um, thank you. You're welcome.